We're going to have a look at what God might be saying to us through, um, through, his, through his word today, through the Bible, um, because we, we love to look at the Bible because it helps inform the way we live. It helps us learn more about Jesus. Uh, it also helps us learn more about ourselves. So in a few moments, um, we're going to read uh, from Matthew chapter 9, starting at verse 9. So if you want to um, grab a Bible from um, the back of the church, if you um, want to kind of check it out on your phone or tablet or, or anything else, that's great. So we'll come to that in a moment. But I want to start by telling you a story. And it's a story about when our Jess, who's our daughter, when she was about four or five, she was that kind of age. We were living in Tunbridge, and three doors down from where we lived, there was another little girl who was the same age as Jess. And if I'm really honest, I wasn't too keen on the friendship. You see, Mum drank a lot. And then Mum was beaten up so badly by her partner that he went to prison for a very long time. And when I popped round to see her after she'd been patched up, uh, to offer my condolences and to take a little bunch of flowers, I discovered that not only was she a regular user of drugs, but she was also a small-time dealer as well. And so, as long as Jess's friend came to our home, I was kind of okay. And then one day, Jess got an invitation to a birthday party. And it was above a pub, and no parents were invited, and Jess wanted to go. It was the philosopher Hegel who came up with the term the other. The other, to describe someone who was different to us. And actually, in society today, we've tended to subcategorize that other description into exotic others and undesirable others. And the undesirable other is the person who doesn't come from such a socially approved or desirable position as the exotic other. And the undesirable other is often the kind of person that we might be a little bit afraid of. And my neighbor didn't fit in to the exotic other category. And so when this invite came through, I wrestled. I wrestled with what Jesus would have me say and what I wanted to say. Suffice to say, Jess went. She had a great time. And I learned quite a lot about myself. And I hope that my attitudes have changed. But however open we think we are, we must recognize within each of us there's a psychological ease in being surrounded by people who are like us. The trouble is, that's just not the way Jesus lived. He reached out and he socialized with those who were different, very different, often. What would it look like if we were to act more like him? This morning, we're going to continue our teaching series, and we, we've been working around a book called Beautiful Resistance by a guy called John Tyson, and it's a really challenging book. It calls us to live counterculturally. 
And so we're going to look at that story from Matthew 9. Um, if you found it in your Bibles, that's fantastic. If you're using one of the ones from the back of the church and you're still struggling um, to find it, it's on page 973. Um, it can be really hard to find ourselves around the, Bi around the Bible sometimes. So, right at the bottom of Nine, page 973, Matthew 9, and I'm starting at verse 9. And it's subheaded, the calling of Matthew. So here Matthew's telling his own story. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. And Matthew got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors, the trouble with new Bibles. <laughs> okay, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but those who are ill. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice, because I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I want us to use our imagination I want us to imagine for a moment that we're Matthew. Just imagine what our life could look like in Matthew's shoes. Day after day and year after year, we sit in a stuffy little booth. And our job is to wait for travellers to come past our booth and to give us the relevant toll that they need to pay to travel from where our little booth is at the edge of one province and to move into another. Those visiting Matthew, us, in our little booth, they don't want to pay that money. And we're not too keen on our job either because people are always grumpy with us. And then, as we're sitting in our hot and our stuffy little booth, a young prophet comes along with a spring in his step and an invitation on his lips. Come, he says, come and follow me. Come and be part of this friendship group. Come into this place of belonging. Come into a new way of living where you are going to fit in. And in these slightly older versions of the Bible, the word used for saying what Matthew next did is arose. It says, Matthew arose. He says, that's what I did. And that word arose it's the language that's used to describe Jesus coming back to life after his death. This is resurrection language that Matthew is using as he receives that invitation from Jesus. This is Matthew's resurrection. This is his new life. What would it look like if we were to act a little more like Jesus? Matthew responds. Matthew responds not only by joining Jesus, but he responds by saying, hey, I'm going to offer you some hospitality. Come round to my home. Let's have something to eat together. And by the way, I want you to meet some of my friends. And in doing so, Matthew sets the stage for Jesus to become known as a friend 
of those who his society deemed as being undesirable others. You see, the religious leaders of Matthew's day saw it as their job to keep the undesirables out just in case they got contaminated by the life or the morals or the uncleanness of those undesirable people. They saw themselves as being the keepers of the quarantine. We've got to put a separation and a barrier up because they didn't want to catch anything. And we're not talking about a physical illness here, but it's this moral or spiritual infection. But Jesus is a frontline worker. He says, I've come like a doctor to heal the sick. What would things look like if we were to act more like Jesus? When we find ourselves in the company of somebody that we say or feel is a bit undesirable, who are we most like? Jesus or maybe the religious leaders of his day? Do we sometimes feel that we want to keep ourselves safe for fear of infection? And who are our undesirable others? And what is it that we are afraid of? Why do we exclude others from our lives? Tyson in his book says, to live like Jesus, hospitality must resist fear. The Greek word for hospitality is philoxenia, or something like that. And it combines two words. It combines philos, which means friend, and xenos, which means foreigner. So rather than fear of the other, hospitality means love for the other. Of course, the reason why Jesus calls us to live like this is, and to love like this is because, of course, he has loved us first. This is the way he loves us. And I don't know about you, but sometimes when I look at the life of Jesus and I think of God sending him to live here on earth, I know his purpose is to save us. But I wonder whether it isn't also to make it absolutely and utterly and completely clear as to what welcoming others in really looks like. What if we were to act more like Jesus? The most difficult food I've ever had to eat was pig's trotters when I was a teenager and I was having a meal at a friend's house. And what was worse, these pig's trotters had come from her father's meat factory. That was the, is, I think, the most difficult food I've ever, ever had to eat. But one of the most challenging meal times I've ever had was probably a couple of years ago when I was part of a 24-7 prayer learning community. And every month we um, studied together and we ate together and we had a practical exercise that we had to do and report back to one another. And one of the tasks towards the end of this learning community eight-month course was to sit down and share a meal with somebody living rough. Not just buy them a meal and give it to them, that, that would be easy, but to actually sit down with them and eat it 
with them. It was actually a really special time, sitting on the pavement outside Primark. I'm not advertising, but that's where we were, in Southampton city centre. And I spent time, a lovely time, chatting with Keith. It was really great, but my fear as I went into the city centre to find somebody to eat with was a really practical barrier. How could I engage in a conversation that would get me from standing up to sitting down without sounding patronising? It was a real barrier for me. I wonder what gets in the way with you spending time with somebody who is part of that group of the other. Thankfully, I spoke to a sister of mine who's uh, got some experience in working with rough sleepers because she volunteers in uh, night shelters during the winter months. And she gave me some really helpful advice. Maybe you could come along to our well-being cafe on a Monday or our food hub cafe on a Friday afternoon where you would find people who are different to you, people that you don't yet know. And you could share a coffee with someone and have a piece of cake. What if we were to take some baby steps to act more like Jesus? The Gospel of Luke is full of stories of Jesus eating with people. So we have in Luke 5 the story that we've looked at today. In Luke 7, Jesus is anointed at the home of Simon the Pharisee during a meal. In Luke 9, Jesus feeds the 5,000. In Luke 10, Jesus eats in the home of Mary and Martha. In Luke 11, Jesus condemns the Pharisees and teachers of the law at a meal. Luke 14, Jesus is at a meal when he urges people to invite the poor to their meals rather than their friends. Luke 19, Jesus invites himself to dinner with Zacchaeus. Luke 22, we have the account of the Last Supper. Luke 24, the risen Christ has a meal with two disciples in Emmaus um, and later eats fish with the disciples in Jerusalem. Somebody called Robert Karras says, it seems that in Luke's gospel, Jesus is either going to a meal, at a meal, or coming from a meal. He really liked to eat. And I guess some of us also enjoy food as well. But this guy, Robert Karras, goes on to notice that most of those that Jesus ate with were those who were viewed as the other by the religious leaders of his day. Jesus humanized those others who others dismissed. And as he welcomed the outsiders in, he extended the welcome of God. And so I wonder why it is that our natural instinct is to use boundary markers to exclude and therefore sometimes dehumanize people around us. Why do we find it so tricky to be like Jesus who deconstructed the boundary markers? Why do we find it so hard to be like Jesus who modeled what so many people are craving? Spaces of welcome where strangers and enemies and outsiders and others can become our friends. To quote a, a New Testament scholar, somebody called Joshua Jip, he says, hospitality is the act or process whereby the identity of the stranger is transformed into that of guest. One of the places where this should happen is in our church. It should happen wherever God's people go. 
but one of the places it should happen is in the church. We should be a place of hope for others and not see church as being our little haven from the world. I've already mentioned how this word hospitality is constructed in Greek. Um, in Latin, the word hospitality has the same root as the word hospital. And originally, the hospital, this word hospital, used to describe a home for strangers. And now, of course, it's become known as a, as a place of healing. Isn't it interesting how we see welcome and healing linked? Isn't it interesting? Welcome and healing are linked. Because you see, healing is what we find when we are welcomed in. Now, I hope if you're new here today, um, a visitor, a stranger to us, you'll have been made really welcome at the door. I hope somebody's come and sat with you or at least chatted with you before the service. And I hope if you haven't got any other plans, you'll take a wander up the corridor because somebody will take you up there and you'll stay and you'll join us for lunch. But what happens after that? How welcoming are we to newcomers to a small group, for example? or other groups and activities that we're involved with here at TBC. It's so easy for us to be frightened or nervous or worried about how the other might challenge our familiar dynamic or might disrupt our cosy friendships instead of recognizing that newcomer is the most wonderful and amazing gift. We rob ourselves of so much joy of what the other can bring when we let fears and preferences get in the way of offering that welcome and letting people in. Later in Matthew's Gospel, he records some really sobering words. Jesus was talking about his return to earth. And if we were to go forward to Matthew chapter 25, starting at verse 31, Matthew writes this. This is what Jesus says. When, finally, when he finally arrives, blazing in beauty, and all of his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him and he'll sort the people out. Much as a shepherd sorts out sheep and goats, putting the sheep to his right and goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Enter, you who are blessed by my father, take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation and this is why. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was shivering and you gave me clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we ever see you sick or in prison and come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling the solemn truth. Whenever you did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me. You did it to me. Then he'll turn to the goats, the ones on his left, and say, Get out, worthless goats. You're good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry, and you gave me no meal. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was homeless, and you gave me no bed. I was shivering, and you gave me no clothes. Sick 
and in prison, and you never visited. Then these goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison and didn't help? He will answer them, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you fail to do one of these things to someone who is being overlooked or ignored, then that was me. You failed to do it to me. Then those goats will be herded to their eternal doom, but the sheep to their eternal reward. These are tough, really tough and challenging words. After the service, having invited you to join us for a, a bring and share lunch, I'm afraid I'm not going to share, um, and, and I haven't brought. Um, I'm dashing off to do a little bit more street pastor training. And, and I'm so looking forward to it. I am so <laughs> looking forward to it. But I think from these words that we've read in Matthew, we have to see that hospitality isn't just a calling for somebody that's excited about going off and becoming a street pastor. It's not just about those who work in our cafe or are in those frontline positions. Hospitality is something we are all required to do. We're all to care for others. We're all to be moved by the plight of those who are overlooked and ignored. We're to do what we can to support inclusion and welcome because that is where we find God is already waiting for us to join him. Matthew reminds us that God disguises himself among the broken and those in need. Hospitality may be the door for eternal reward. When I sat with that rough sleeper, um, a couple of years ago when I sat with Keith I noticed that people weren't putting any money in his pot and I wondered whether it was because I was sitting there so I suggested that I moved on and his reply was so precious he said you are listening to me today and that is more precious than anything else. I offered 20 minutes of my time. That is more precious than anything else. So I wonder who God might want us to encounter this week with an invitation. Tell me a little bit more about yourself. Or how's your day going? Or, do you fancy a coffee? Or, if we're out and we see somebody sitting alone, is seat taken? Mind if I join you? What would it look like if we acted like Jesus did? And it may feel scary to do this as a street pastor, <laughs> or working with homeless people or coming along somebody that we just don't know. But we've got so many opportunities within these walls. Any of our community ministries gives you the opportunity to work with the other people that aren't yet part of our Sunday church. Any of our youth and our children's ministries give us the opportunity to work with the other. Those youngsters that aren't yet part of our church community. And of course there are plenty of ministries like street pastors and so on and so forth if we feel that we want to get a bit more involved. 
Now I can see Mavis sitting here and I'm just going to embarrass her for a moment because I know that she had a call from God not that long ago to offer hospitality. And so we've launched something called, and I've just, I haven't written it down, I want to say just eat, and I know it's not that. Come eat. <laughs> Thank you, Mavis. Well done. Oh, the amateur, the amateur in me. Come eat. And it's a way of Mavis offering her home as a way of gathering people that don't yet know each other around her table to enjoy company and excellent, excellent food. If you haven't signed up, there are sign-up sheets either um, end of this building. That might be the first baby step we take in offering ourselves around a table to another, somebody we don't yet know. So we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you to stand. And I'm going to ask us to spend a few moments just quietly before the Lord and ask him where our fears get in the way of being welcoming and hospitable in our encounters with other people. And I know some of us are really shy and some of us get really anxious when we have to meet people that we don't know. Some of us are wired very differently to the person that will go up and talk to anyone because we are wonderfully created, we're fearfully made. But if hospitality is something that the Lord requires from all of us, our question to him is to say, how can I, who find inviting people, talking to people so very difficult, how can even I take that first step? Because I don't believe that God wants us to be excluded from this great invitation. I believe he will show us a way. So we're going to spend a moment or two just waiting on God to maybe reveal to us those things that make us most frightened about being hospitable and encountering the other. Maybe the Lord will show you a particular type of person or a particular setting or some of those things within us where we say, but God, I just don't know that I can. And as God shows us the answer to some of those difficulties, just some, because he is a God who comes alongside and takes little steps with us. He works at our pace. We don't always have to work at his. Maybe we can just raise our hands a little, put them out in a... In a, in a kind of a, a posture of surrender and say, God, I may not have much to offer, but I will offer what I can. Lord, I thank you that you know us completely and utterly. You know where we struggle. And you know what brings us great delight. And you know that because we're all flawed people, sinful people, we would much prefer so often to play it safe. But you call us to step 
out of whatever comfort zone we create for ourselves and say, dip a toe in. You call us to dip our toes in. And so, Lord, as we allow your Holy Spirit to work within us, I pray that you will give us opportunities to see that the other can be such a joy. That the courage isn't as great as we think it might be because you are already there. Lord, I thank you for the times that you've challenged me and the ways that you continue to challenge me. And I pray that for each of us here, you won't leave us where we are, but you will lead us on into this sphere of being, people who can offer small aspects of hospitality because in your strength we can resist our fears. So thank you, Lord. Amen.